Welcome to the premiere episode of season two of Dumbest in the Room. Today, I'm joined by former educator, now bakery owner, Crystal Spellman. Crystal, thank you so much for being here. Not a problem, Stephen. Thanks for having me. So as I mentioned, you're a former educator. So talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get into where you are now owning Plaza Bakery. So um, I actually started back in 2002, um, worked at Indy River High School um, on the administration side. Um, it was basically, you know, you, you start off as administration, but then you end up being so much more. Um, so, you know, I mentored a lot of kids and, you know, pretty much that was why I know I was put there um, inside of the school system because there were just so many kids that needed some guidance um, that also needed, you know, just someone, um, you know, I just didn't recognize how many kids were lacking um, so many different things, whether it was coming to love or, um, you know, understanding um, just anything that you would think that kids would already have, they just don't have. And so, um, you know, it started out as, pretty much a job, um, just like anybody else would seek out in the education field. But then it became so much more. Um, and I come from a Christian, you know, family. So I'm always looking to find out ways that I can help people. And that right there, just, you know, it became a niche of mine for, um, helping kids and, you know, it just became a love. And so I knew that that's why God had put me there. And, um, it just went for 18 years, longer than I thought. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, way longer than I thought. Um, but I, you know, throughout the middle of it, I was like, okay, well, you know, I've done it this long. I think I'm just going to stick at it and I'm just going to retire here. You know, um, there's always new kids coming. So somebody's going to need me. Um, and so I kept adding on another year and another year. But during that time, I love bacon as well. So, um, you know, I would do that like after school, like I would come home and I would get cakes done and, you know, call my clients and be like, it's ready, <laughs> you know, seven and eight o'clock at night. Um, but, you know, it just became a thing where people just really started falling in love with my desserts. And, you know, it was getting to be where I wasn't able to reach as many kids as, you know, I had done in the past just because, you know, the millennials came along and um, <laughs> the millennials are more like, you know, well, I'll kind of tell you what, uh, you know, what, what should be happening. Like, and I was, I didn't feel, you know, that need um, as much as I did in the past. So I started leaning more towards what I love to do, which was found peace in baking. So so had you always been um, selling your baked goods while you were administrating at Indian River High School or were you kind of doing no, bake sales not. or something? Yeah, I really wasn't um, doing it the entire time. It was just um, something that I kind of started doing to kind of relieve anxiety. Um, and it runs in my family. Anxiety runs in my family. Like, you know, my mom has it. So I was one of those that would be like, yeah, this will never touch me. Like anxiety. No, I can deal with it. I'll just pray it away. It's fine. I'll be good. Um, but then one day it hit me and I was like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> so then I started needing to find ways to actually deal with it. And, um, I started to, you know, bake and I found out that it calms me. Um, and then I went through kind of a tragic situation to me anyways, and any mom would understand this, but my, um, my youngest son was getting ready to go to college, which meant that I was becoming an empty nester. Um, and for some, you know, that's like, woohoo, especially dads. Like, we're like, get out. I get my wife back. You know, I'm going to do my thing. <laughs> but for moms, that's a hard thing to do to see your baby, you know, leave the nest. And so um, I started feeling like, what's next? Like, what do I do now? And then um, the anxiety, like, went to a trillion Wow. And I couldn't, I couldn't get my way out of it. Um, and I, I've tried a lot of other things, but, you know, the baking piece was, seems like the one I always went back to, um, to find something to do with that time that I put into, you know, my kid. So now I'm looking at it like, okay, I need to bake every day because I need to keep this anxiety down. And so that's what I did. And, you know, eventually it was like, God was like, okay, you know, maybe your season's changing. Um, and that's the way it felt. 
And normally when he tells me that my season is changing, I always throw a temper tantrum as normal. And I'm like, you know, no, I don't want to change. Like there's too much to do to change, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I eventually just said, okay, you know, I'm going to stop running from it. I know that this is what you're going to have me to do next. And that's what I did. I, you know, started preparing myself, um, you know, as far as, you know, financially um, and getting into basically that time frame of being able to not be at a full time job like that, but, you know, still be able to bake and have that clientele and, you know, do things that I love. So that's how it happened. In the early days, were you kind of coming up with your own recipes? Were you using family secrets for when you had clients that were, that you were getting to at seven or eight at night? Yeah. So I started out with family secrets and, um, it was like, I would look at the family secret. I would taste the family secret and I would be like, you know, what would taste really good is if I added this or maybe I'll take this out. I think this would be better. Like whether it's a flavoring or spice or, you know, something like that. So, um, I started doing that with the family recipes, which now makes them, my own because you know it's just a whole it it changes you know the product tremendously um and so that's where we went we went with um starting out with family recipes but then eventually rolling on to my own just experimenting Mm -hmm. um and experimenting at first i started you know kind of doing food as well and my husband and my son you know weren't really feeling that um and they they were brutally honest they were like so your desserts are great (laughs) but your uh food (laughs) maybe we should stick on the dessert side and so um yeah so i decided that i was gonna stay on the dessert side so you were an educator for 18 years you said and then plaza bakery comes along how do you acquire plaza bakery So, um, someone actually came to one of my pop-up shops. So I did a pop-up and, um, I was selling my desserts and everybody was going crazy. I was selling out all over the place. Um, and then someone who actually tasted my desserts gave me a call and said, um, so there's an opportunity that I think that you need to take a look at. And um, she says, your desserts are great. Um, You have to sell like your stuff. You have to like, you can't hold this to yourself. Like you have to give it to the world. So I was like, okay, you know, that sounds fine and good, but I do like my own little kitchen where, you know, I don't have a bunch of overhead and, you know, all that good stuff. And um, basically, you know, she was like, well, you know, if God presents an opportunity, it's not just, you know, for no reason. So you know, you might need to just take a look at it. And so I did. And it looks like um, a great opportunity. It was um, a bakery that had already been around since 1959. um, And it was just basically a staple in the community. And so it was one of those things where if this bakery closes down, like so many people would probably be really hurt behind the bakery closing. And, um, to me, it was like kind of the perfect opportunity to start a dream and also kind of keep one going Mm -hmm. um, because it had just been around for so long. So went through the process of looking at all of the, um, the numbers, um, seeing if it worked um, or not, if it was profitable um, and also what it was doing in the community. And so the more and more that I looked at it, the more and more it looked great. But at the same time, I still had all of those reservations. So it was just, I guess, that inner me saying, can you really do this? Like, you know, you know, you've been doing it inside of your kitchen, but this is a whole new ball game. Um, You're going to have like rent. You're going to have like a huge light bill. You're going to have all of that. That's something that, you know, you got to be ready for. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I talked to um, the owner of Plaza Bakery and um, she's also a Christian woman. And, you know, the more and more that we talk to each other, um, she says that she felt like I was the one that God brought forth to kind of keep the bakery going. And um, I was like, okay, well, that sounds all fine and good, but you know, there's a lot, a lot more to this, (laughs) a lot more to this. Um, And so I just, 
I guess, did my research, um, you know, talked to a bunch of mentors um, that I have that, you know, are business minded um, and just kind of went from there. That's awesome. Talk more about Plaza being a staple. I didn't know it was, you said 1959. Mm -hmm. Like I know that my mom and her family had been getting cakes from Plaza for birthdays since she was Mm -hmm. at least four years old and maybe a couple of ice cream cakes thrown in there, maybe not every year, but I mean, it's, it's been around. Yeah, it has been around. Um, It started off in the, um, I guess what you call Nas Bakery. Have you ever heard of Nas Bakery in Norfolk? No. Okay. So there was an old, old bakery um, that was Nas Bakery and it kind of, um, it was basically a staple in Norfolk, but then they kind of branched off and went into Virginia Beach. And it ended up in Princess Anne Plaza, right over there where um, like Sam's Club and all that is. Mm -hmm. So it ended up in Princess Anne Plaza, hence the name Plaza Bakery. And so um, that's where it kind of, you know, started at and and became Plaza Bakery, branched off of Nas Bakery. Yeah. Um, You know, it being a staple like that, it obviously comes with its dedicated clients. Is that, have you found that a lot of the same people are coming in and I'm sure you've brought your own um, crowd in that you've known for a long time. Yeah. So um, the crowd that was actually the, the old, um, you know, clientele, they were still coming in, um, but it was really a tough act to follow. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, people don't just get used to a product, they get used to people. Um, and so that was really, really tough because, you know, here I am coming in with my new bright ideas and also still trying to perfect the, you know, ideas that they had. And so that was not an easy process. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was, to be honest with you, it was extremely difficult. And a lot of the old, um, customers that were there and the, you know, loyal customers that were there, they just weren't feeling it. You know, they were just like, you know, we don't, we don't want anything new. We just want you to keep doing what you've been doing and um, just stay, stick with that. And so it was hard to do that because there was also, when you look at the finances, there was a lot of things that needed to um, be adjusted. Um, there were a lot of wastes that, you know, comes into trying to keep things out all day long, um, you basically have a ton of waste at the end of the night, mm-hmm. uh, which basically affects your bottom line. And so um, I had to go in there and do a whole cost analysis of exactly what it takes to run Plaza Bakery. And so doing that cost analysis, you know, brought changes. And so those changes, they weren't received well in the beginning. Um And so I, I, it was one of those things where I was like, okay, God, well, you put me here. So I'm assuming that you're going to work through this thing. Um, And so he did. And eventually, you know, the complaint stopped the, you know, angriness of, you know, why did you change the floors? There was nothing wrong with the floors. Um, You know, uh, the paint on the wall, what happened to the saying that said that if you're fat, you're, you know, harder to kidnap or, (laughs) you know, (laughs) um, they didn't like that. That saying was, you know, taken off the wall. Um, You know, it was so many different things that that was just, you know, what they were used to and and change was just really hard for them. And I was definitely change. Yeah. I mean, you can't please everybody, I guess, but I personally love what you've done with the place. I mean, not to knock the old one, but it needed some updating for sure. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I put in a lot of work, so I appreciate it. It looks like 2022 in there. It looks great. Thank you. Thank you. That that (laughs) was what I thought, but you know, (laughs) so thanks. That feels good to hear that. Thanks. Talk more about the, um, you know, you said you did the cost analysis and everything. Did you kind of I find that easy or difficult after with your background as a working administration at the school. I don't know if yeah, you're working with finances was, at the school, but. Right. So while I was at the school, um, I also dealt in um, the accountant part of it too, um, because, you know, we had all the different clubs and everything and I was the actual backup bookkeeper. So for 18 years, I was an actual backup bookkeeper and I kind of, um, 
was thrown into it for a while, um, for actually six to eight months being a full-time bookkeeper because the bookkeeper got into a car accident that was really, really bad. Wow. And so they were like, okay, you're up. <laughs> and I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it just kind of takes you back to show you and I, you know, how God kind of reveals to you, okay, you remember that? Well, this is why I had you doing that because I knew you were going to need it for this. And, you know, so he's actually over time, you know, right now has taken me back through life and kind of showed me, you know, how he placed me in certain positions to be um, ready for this position right here. And so that, um, helped me out a lot. I'm going to be totally honest with you to be able to understand numbers because I was in that position, um, helped me tremendously. And I was able to go in and say, okay, you know, how much does this bag of flour cost? And and that's pretty much what you got to do. You got to go through every single item that it, that it costs, to um, make a, you know, the product, the finished product. And so once you do all of that and you put it all together, then you see how much you're actually selling it for. And then you say, so I'm losing money. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you just have to find, you know, what it is that you need to sell it for in order to, you know, at least make a profit. And I think that because Plaza Bakery had been around for so long, that um, they didn't want to do it to their customers. They didn't want to make those, you know, price increases. They didn't want to, you know, make changes to the way that they were um, wasting, you know, certain products and things like that, just because they wanted to please the customers, which, you know, is good. But, you know, at the same time, 20 years of not going up, in pricing with inflation and everything else that's going on around you, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is one of the reasons why, you know, they ended up saying, okay, we can't keep doing this because we're just not making any money. Um, and so that's where the cost analysis was definitely necessary to find out, you know, how to make it profitable. Does doing that, dealing with that kind of thing, does that sort of take the fun out of the baking part of it? For sure. For sure. I'm going to be totally honest with you. Um, and I know other people will hear this too, but <laughs> I mean, I, uh, honesty is the key and I'm just going to say it like it definitely takes the fun out of it. Like I don't have the love for baking that I used to have. And every once in a while when I go back there and I'm doing something I'm like, hmm, so this is what it feels like. But at the same time, I've been so bogged down with the last year of just the business portion of it, um, making sure that things are where they're supposed to be, that it didn't leave me a lot of time to bake. Um, and so I relied a lot on my staff and my team to make sure that that was going on. Um, so that I could try and make sure that everything survived and stayed afloat. Wow. I can't even imagine. And then you, I mean, you started right when the pandemic kicked off. Yeah. Yeah, sure did. Um, it was just, I think that time frame was just basically that this is the time that it was being sold. And it was one of those things where she was like, you know, listen, if you don't, if you don't do it, then it's done type deal. And so um, I had to pull out a lot of faith and say, well, if this opportunity was brought to me, then, you know, I know that you'll take me through it. So, you know, we're going to give it a go, pandemic and all, <laughs> which which afterwards, like six months afterwards, I was like, what did you do? But, <laughs> but um, you know, nonetheless, um, I haven't missed a beat. My staff has been paid um, every time. And that just became, you know, my focus, making sure that my staff could get paid and that the store was still running open and we're still moving forward and prospering. So that's great. Well, I mean, at least on the outside, it looks like you're doing very well. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's, <laughs> it's coming along. It's coming along. We, we've still got some some rabbits to pull out of the hat, but uh, it's coming. It's coming. Thank you. I don't want to get too like personal into your finances of the business, but I mean, I looked at the grocery store next door and I was like, that'd be a good place for a, an indoor go-kart track. Cause that's one of my favorite things. And the closest one to us uh, went out of business. Rent yeah. is expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, what is it like with that 
hanging over your head, going from the kitchen in your, in your house to now having to not only, you know, pay your employees and, and for all the items, but you got to keep the place running itself. Yeah. Um, so what, what it basically turns into is you don't pay yourself. Um, and that first year, that's what I had to do. Um, and so that's, that was, you know, a good thing for me to, um, make sure that everything was kind of in order before I actually took the leap. Um, and normally the first couple of years in business, you don't make money anyway. Um, so, you know, I kind of took that approach to it just in case. And the rent portion of having to pay that on top of, you know, the utilities and on top of paying employees, pretty much at the end of the day, sometimes your bottom line doesn't allow you to get paid. And so you just have to, you know, keep moving forward to, you know, always bring out new products, always come up with new ways of, you know, generating income and things like that. So it's one of those things where I'm just going to make sure that everything else is set. And when the time comes, because it will come and the business is, you know, a little bit older, I know that then I'll start being able to pay myself. So big picture. Big picture. Yeah. So when it comes to actually baking the items, what is like one of the easiest things to bake and what is like one of the hardest things to bake? What is the customer's favorite? Um, so one of the easiest things I would say to bake is a muffin. Um, you can't mess that up. It's basically, you know, flavoring, uh, you know, sugar, um, flour, um, you know, whatever else it is that you want to put inside of it. It's pretty much a basic, you know, recipe. You can't mess up a muffin. Um, anybody can do that. I probably so can mess it I up. Would say, yeah, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to mess it up either, Steven. <laughs> Trust me, it's an easy thing to do. Um, that would be one of the easiest things I would say is the muffins um, that we do. Um, I would say one of the hardest things that we have to do, uh, and which is the customer favorite is the metaphor. And how do you do that? If you can get, I don't oh know if you can give away the God. secret, but. Well, there's really not a secret unless you know what we put in it because the almond wedding cake is the actual flavor of this metaphor, which if you don't give that out, nobody can get it. Right but it's a process. And I don't think that people really understand the process on how much work we put into this actual metaphor. But in order to come out with a little one inch square, um, that's perfectly, you know, square, um, we actually use a ruler. Like we have to get precise with it. Wow. And so, um, which also means that when you're putting the batter into the pan, it also has to be leveled at a certain height. Like all of that is, is what makes the metaphor what it is. And so um, once you bake the actual cake, which starts off in a sheet pan, by the way, so you have a sheet pan and then you have to cut all of these one inch squares. And then once you put them on a rack, um, then you freeze them for a little while so that the consistency of the cake is perfect for icing. We freeze them, we take them out of the freezer. Then we put a light layer of fondant um, and it's a liquid fondant that you kind of pour over and it's a fondant icing. So we basically ice every single pan mm -hmm. with the fondant and we have to make sure that it gets all down the sides of it um, perfectly so none of the cake is exposed. And then we put them back into the freezer. Um, so that it can dry. Once we do that, it has to dry overnight. We come back the next day, pull them out, and then we have to put the little buds that go on them. You know, some people want red buds. Some people want pink buds. It just depends. Some people want booties on them. It just, um, for any occasion that you basically will want them for, we can make them. So, once we put those decorations on them, they have to go back in so that that can freeze. And basically it comes out then, you know, the next day and it's ready. But that process, when you look at something that's a fan favorite and you have to have that in there every day, you can imagine that every day somebody's back there with that ruler like... <laughs> <laughs> 
And so people see them. And when I say, you know, when they're like, okay, well, how much is that? And I'm like, so it's $1.99 each. And they're like, $1.99 each. And then I'm like, it's $17.99 dozen. $17.99 dozen. I'm like, if you only knew, you know, when you break down the cost analysis of how much it costs to have someone back there literally on pedophile duty, mm. um, you know, you have to pay that person by the hour. You have to make sure that, you know, every, all of the ingredients is there and you have to pay for that. Not talking about how much the ingredients have gone up. Um, and seventeen ninety nine is how much they've been, but I'm not even factoring in what the cost is that has gone up on that item yet, because I know it'll freak them out. Mm. So <laughs> it's like, you know, that's the type of now I feel, I guess, what the Freemans felt back then when they were like, OK, well, we don't want to go up on, you know, the items. But at the same time, if I'm going to run a business there is going to eventually have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk about like, you know, the metaphors were, a have always been a plaza staple. How do you put your trust in? Obviously I'm sure they trained you on how to do it to their mm -hmm. standards. How do you put your trust in an employee to, to keep the standards? Cause you know, maybe an employee doesn't have the same love for it that you do. Right. So um, that comes with picking good team members. Um, and when I say team members, it's because I feel like we're all a part of the team. If, if one person um, is there, two people there, three people there, then we can get it done. But once you find a good team member, you know, and you know who that person is, the trust kind of comes automatically um, because you have to trust someone. You can't you can't do it all yourself. Um, so you have to trust someone and, and that's pretty much what you go off of and, and you trust them until they give you a reason not to trust them. Um, and I, I like to do a lot of, um, you know, like training and not just be a boss, but my thing is to be a leader. Um, and to kind of, you know, guide you along the way and not just be like, you know, no, that's not right. Da, 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 da. I would like to be more of, OK, well, can I show you, you know, a better way of doing this? Or can I show you how to make sure that the square is cut, you know, right? Or, you know, just just kind of walking them through it. And then once I walk them through it, that basically, you know, shows them how to do it correctly and then they can move on. Um, I do a lot of culinary students that come from Virginia Culinary Institute. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them come through Plaza to, you know, kind of get their hours and see what it feels like to work in a real bakery. And so um, teaching them how to do it so that all of that, it's a lot of fun, you know, actually, because it kind of puts me back into the mentoring role that I was doing so much of with the kids. And so um, that piece of it, I think, kind of helps me with the joy of having and owning a business. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'd never considered that it would be culinary students who have to do something like that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about people like different things on top of their pedophores. Let's talk about like custom orders. I see a lot of like, I think today uh, you guys posted a picture of, I guess, somebody turned 20 and had like a weight lifting uh, yeah. cake. I mean, when somebody comes to you with, <laughs> when somebody comes to you with, with a request, I mean, are you always confident that you're going to make it happen? Do you just trial and error? Like, okay, I think I can do that. Let me see if I can figure it out. Yeah. Well, um, you have a good design team is what you have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I say they are the anchor, they are really the anchor because we get so many people with so many different things. Um, and so what we do is, you know, we ask them to bring us like, you know, send us a picture to the email so that we can see kind of sort of where their vision is. And then we actually call them like, we have that personal touch with the customers where we call them and say, you know, okay, this is what we see. Um, so what are your thoughts about doing this or doing that? And we come up, come up with a final design that pretty much makes everybody happy. And so um, I think a lot of people, they sometimes don't like the pricing of cakes um, when it's a custom themed cake, but there's a lot of different work that goes into that stuff. And I, I think that's really what people don't understand. 
um, because they're not in the big, they're not bakers, you know, they're not designers, they're not uh, cake decorators, they just don't know what goes into it. So it's hard for them to say, you know what, that's worth it. But at the same time, if they kind of think about it and be like, well, can I do this? Uh, no, that's why I'm calling them. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of, you know, should give them some type of, you know, inkling that this is, you know, you have to be able to pay for what you're trying to achieve. So the dumbbell cake um, or the weightlifting cake that you saw today um, was done in part fondant and part buttercream icing, which is, you know, sometimes what we try to lean the customers to. The site is a really, really great thing. And then it can also be one of those things where customers see something, but they really don't want to pay the price for, you know, the, the finished product. So um, that one, when you talk about theme, there are so many different things that people call us for. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be to, they want their dog on the cake. Um, you know, they, their boyfriend lifts weights like, like today, like, he lifts a lot of weights. Like I know that's important to him. So can you do something with, you know, some weights on it and da 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 da. And so we like those cakes the most because we feel like those are the most personal cakes. Like if you can actually give someone a cake with a theme that of something that they love, like it makes that all much better than to just be a birthday cake. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah. mm -hmm. what is like, I mean, you talked about a dog. What are like some of the obscure things people want? Oh, I mean, you just anything. Um, we have doggy cupcakes that we do for dog parties. Um, we have dog bones that we do and we make those custom um, at the shop. Um, so we have to make sure that we use all of the products that are safe for dogs. So we do the, um, the no sugar applesauce because we know dogs can't have sugar. Um, we use the peanut butter because we know that dogs love peanut butter, but we also have to use a wheat flour, um, because it's basically not a lot of gluten inside of that. It's just all wheat. And so, which is a, a basic, you know, flour that's, that's better for dogs. So, um, we do those. Um, and then sometimes people come in and they actually buy like a six inch cake for a dog. Like some people let their dogs eat sugar. And I don't think it's good, but they want one. We, we, okay, here you go. Um, but, you know, it just depends on what they ask for. We pretty, we've done it all, Stephen. I mean, it truly is an art. I mean, if people have ever watched like the cake shows, I mean, it's it's not like your average, you know, it's not buying a cake mix and mm -hmm. doing, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. So the price right. definitely, I mean, you know, it's worth the price for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely worth it. Um, and so, you know, you try to just explain that to customers. Um, and just, like I said, sometimes it's just hard, whether it's just not in their budget and they don't have the money or, um, sometimes they just don't want to pay that price, but it definitely is worth it. If And I think that looking at the fact that there's a lot that goes into the finished product from baking the cake, which you have bakers at the shop, and then you have decorators at the shop. So you're looking at, you know, the price that it costs to pay bakers to do the baking piece of it. And then you have the cost of paying decorators to finish out the product and, you know, and all of that. So it's just a lot that's involved. How do you estimate the cost? Like if I were to call you and say, I want a cake um, that, you know, looks like my golden doodle daisy. I mean, how do you, are you able to give a cost right there on the phone? Do you have to go like, okay, let me run some numbers. Like how, how do you even estimate something like that? Yeah, well, basically we have to take the amount of time that it's going to be to create the design. Um, and then once we figure out exactly what the time frame is going to be um, and then how difficult the design is, whether or not we have to have, say, for instance, if somebody wants a tie-dye cake, then you're looking at purple, blue, yellow, red, um, green, and all of that. And it's just like you got all of these amazing colors. But remember that the icing starts out white. So you have to have basically, you know, all of these different jars of, of coloring that we have to put in there and you have to factor in the time that it takes to make all of those colors. And then you have to factor how much icing it's taking to make all of these colors. And after that, whatever the design is and how long it takes, because sometimes you got to, you know, draw a piece of it first here, then you got to put it in the fridge to make sure that the design stays tight and then it doesn't bleed. Um, and 
and then you go over and you know finish this part or add this piece on whether or not they're doing fondant which is a very expensive product um rolled fondant you know cakes basically can cost thousands of dollars if you're doing a wedding cake or you know cakes that you see on tv which are designer cakes Mm -hmm. um they're they're the ones that you know cost the most and takes the most time you mentioned at the at the beginning um having a lot of waste how do you kind of cut back on that um so in the beginning it was hard to cut back on it because like i said people just want what they want they want it to be there when they walk in they want it there and they don't care how long it'll be before they come back they want it there right then and so um as a business owner you just have to be smart and know that if a product is not being sold every day and it's not doing well and you're constantly throwing it away that product is a product that's not going to survive and so people want that specific product but they don't realize that if you come in one time for this product and then you don't come again for six months for the same product then that means from the time that you came in the last time to the time now i've thrown away Mm -hmm. thousands of dollars just because you want it to be there this time you came in and six months from now when you come in. So that cost analysis was something that I had to do to figure out what product was selling well, what product was not selling well. And some of the products that they used to have, some of them made it and some of them didn't. Interesting. So you keep like a running like statistics tally kind of thing of, of what's going and what's not. Yeah. So that's what I was able to do that with achieving, um, a good system and and having a good system in in the shop is a POS system by Clover. um, And it pretty much is basically a big brain of numbers. And so I can see every month by printing out a report, it'll tell me what did good and what didn't. And so that helps me to know, you know, you can't keep wasting money baking this product if it's not going out the door. Um, And and we, we go from there. Interesting. Interesting. What does the future hold for, for you and for Plaza Bakery? Um, you know, I wish I knew, um, just like I thought I knew that I was going to be in the school system for the rest of my life uh, until it was retirement age. Um, you just never know. And so until, you know, God tells me that season is changing or whatever, you know, it's, it's moving and taking one day at a time. Um, definitely continuing to bring new products. And a lot of times people say, well, why don't you have a menu? Well, if I go and get this big, huge menu and, and print up all of these things on it, and then it doesn't sell, what do I do? Go and get a brand new menu all over again. But when you're a custom bake shop like that and things are ever changing, it's really smart not to do that. Um, because you don't want people to get, think that, you know, they're getting accustomed to one thing and then next thing you know, it's not there anymore. Um, and so it's a way to do business. I think that is the smart way. Um, sometimes it feels weird, you know, because when somebody comes in, like you want them to, you want them to buy what you have, but sometimes they want that specific thing and you don't want to turn people away. Um, if you don't have that specific thing, but at the same time, you have to be able to survive. So the future of it is, you know, possibly moving. Um, and I know that that is like a really, really big deal. That's going to take time because now people are going to have to say, well, why aren't you, you know, at uh, Regency Hilltop anymore? <laughs> why are you moving? <laughs> you know, that was the perfect location. It was five minutes from my house or, you know, things like that. But um, to be honest, Regency Hilltop is not growing. Um, the shopping center is, is basically dated. It's been around for a long time. They don't really do a lot of updating to it at all. Um, we've had several break-ins around there, including my shop. Mm. Um, my shop has been broken into the shop, ne- the place next to me, which is the med supply store that's been broken into. Um, the golf store is the last one that was broken into. And I don't know if someone just was extremely pissed about it. I mean, we're all pissed when we get broken into, but 
the golf store, like they got broken into and then they packed up and left. So I don't know if they were like on a month to month, you know, or what, but when that, when it happened to them, they were like, we are out of here. Oh, like yeah. we came in there, like literally like four days later, we looked and the shop was closed. Like everything was out of it. They were gone. Uh-huh. Um, but like, you know, sometimes you're just stuck into it. You're stuck into a lease. And so regardless of, you know, what the landlord does, like you have to stay there, like no matter what, what happens or what goes on. So you're locked in because you're, you're locked into this lease. Right. But so many things like your store gets broken into, we have so many, um, random things like people just walking around randomly. Like, um, we had, um, basically a, I guess it was maybe an armed robbery with the Navy Federal Cross over there by Dollar Tree. Um, you know, so that type of stuff, like, it can hurt you because people are like, you know, well, hmm, they had an armed robbery over there at Navy Federal. I'm not going to Regency Hilltop no more. Well, guess where Crystal is? Guess where Plas Bakery is? Hello, I'm still over here. <laughs> um, so all of that, you know, and the landlord doesn't come and say, you know, well, we've been having all these break-ins and we know that it's probably affecting your business. So we're going to take your rent down by 500. Yeah, that doesn't happen. And so you just have to pretty much stay in it regardless of what happens. So I know that with everything that I've been through, seeing this shopping center just kind of continue to go downhill, I know that that's one of my major like things that I want to do. I definitely want to move locations. Yeah. Well, I best of luck with that. I hope, you know, like, that's a big, big deal. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, they do have that big store that you were talking about, about putting like the, what'd you say, a skate park? Go-kart, indoor go-kart. A go-kart, indoor go-kart. It would be funny if you put an uh, indoor go-kart. That would be so much fun um, because the size of it is there, right? But there used to be like a big food line there and like everybody went to that food line. But now the food line's gone. So that's also the thing, you know, um, where you don't have that feeder store. You don't have people that constantly come. So nobody comes unless they're specifically coming to you. So there's that foot traffic that you don't get. Um, So that's another reason why I definitely want to move. And then, you know, looking at my, my store, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back or anything like that, but uh, the modern look is basically what I'm looking for. Um, And so I would definitely like to be somewhere that's more modern, like, you know, town center, you know, something like that. You just never know. Yeah. That'd be great. Town center would be a great spot. I could see you fit in there. Yeah, because there's so much, you know, foot traffic around there. You know, the the look of it is nice. People like to be there. Um, It just feels good to be in town center. I know I feel good when I walk around town center, Um, but I can see myself there. I can see the shop there. Yeah, I can see it there, too. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for for talking with me today. I really appreciate you taking the time, and, and I wish you the best of luck with everything in the future, whether you, you know, stay or go, whether you go this year, whether you go in 10 years, best of luck. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. I enjoyed this. I didn't know we had been up here so long already. Time flies when you're having fun. Dang right. <laughs> yeah. <you. laughs> well, best of luck to you. Stay, uh, stay safe in this snow, this storm coming. And um, hopefully um, you'll be able to talk to your fiance and make sure that she's cool up there. See it's kidding. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining for season two of Dumbest in the Room. I just want to remind you that we're on all listening platforms. I also want to remind you that we're on social media at Dumbest ITR on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook at Dumbest in the Room. I'd appreciate a follow and a like. Thanks so much.